Well, hi everyone. We're in our biblical counseling equipping class session number 13. We've covered repentance for the past few weeks. That's the first part of the path to change is to turn away from sin on the inside. That there is an inner mourning and hatred, and bitterness, um, bitterness uh, against sin. And then as you turn, the flip side of that coin is you're turning to someone. You're turning to something, and that's faith. And the other side of repentance is faith. Turning to Christ through faith and worship as you've turned away from sin. Now, how does that happen? Okay, how does that change happen? What does it take for me to turn from sin and turn to Christ and see him as more delightful and satisfying? Thomas Chalmers uh, gives, us, uh, uh, gives us great insight into this process in his sermon, his classic sermon, The Expulsive Power of a New Affection. And his thesis in that sermon is basically this, that you and I can only uproot one affection with another affection. Right? You can't just sort of like wait for you know, time to pass, so you'll just get mature, and so you'll grow out of those old affections, or something will have to happen from the outside. The only way to uproot an old affection, a sinful affection, an idolatrous lust or affection, is to uproot it by the expulsive power of another affection, a new affection, an affection for Christ. Um, you cannot force yourself to be joyfully drawn to something else. If you're attached, your heart is attached, worshiping and treasuring one thing, it is impossible in your own strength to, to just sort of move yourself, move your heart from one object of affection to another. The heart has to have a superior affection inside of it. Now, think of all of this in terms of a meal. When we are worshiping an idol, we're eating or we think we're eating a juicy filet. But we need to be shown that it's actually dung. My mouth is watering for rubbish, for dung, for garbage. But I'm convinced that that thing, even if it's a good thing, Oh, when it becomes an idol, we know how disastrous it is, how destructive it is. I need to be convinced by the Spirit that that is dung. I need to see that because I'm convinced that it's Wagyu beef. Now, I think deep down for a believer especially, and I think to some degree for unbelievers, but especially for believers, deep down, we know that that idol is not Wagyu beef. We know it's not even close. It's not even a Slim Jim. It's dung. It's rubbish. And that happens because I'm not fixed on the banquet that is Christ and the gospel that's right in front of me. In fact, it's inside of me. It's not far from me. But I do have to take up the gospel. I do have to take Christ up and eat and taste his sweetness and his goodness. And what, what then happens is, is that my, the affections for that meal, for that new meal, for Christ will push out the old affections for whatever falsely was believed or what for whatever falsely believed was a sumptuous meal when in fact it was dung all along. John Piper writes this about repentance and faith. He says, repenting means experiencing a change of mind, all right, that now sees God as true and beautiful and worthy of all of our praise and all our obedience. This change of mind also embraces Jesus in the same way. We know this because Jesus said, If God were your father, you would love me, for I came from God. Seeing God with a new mind includes seeing Jesus with a new mind. Now, I just want to, this is in your handout, but I just want to point out these couple of things here. A change of mind that now sees, how do you see as a believer? You see by faith. That now sees God as true and beautiful and worthy of all of our praise and all our obedience and then embracing Jesus in the same way that we embrace God the Father. Seeing Jesus and seeing God as true, beautiful, and worthy of praise and adoration and all of our obedience, our whole lives. Love God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. How do I see that God is that lovely and that worth it? By faith. As I turn from sin, I turn to Christ and I see him in the gospel in all of his glory and beauty. When I see those eternal glories, 2 Corinthians 
that is true faith happening. That is true faith engaging. Now, we're going to look at um, how to fuel faith and worship. And as we enter into that, I want to turn our attention for a moment to Psalm 63, where David is in the wilderness of Judah, and he's running away from his son Absalom. Uh, and he is in the desert. And you can just imagine David here. What are some of the desires or affections that could be in his heart? I mean, he could just want comfort and peace, right? And be back in his palace, be back in his kingdom, be back with his people, back on the throne, back in Israel. He would want his kingdom. He would want the crown. He would want his son's love and respect and admiration. But look at what happens, or look at what he reveals in verses 1 to 4. See the superior worship that drives out the inferior worship. See the new affections drive out the old affections. Look at Psalm 63, 1 to 5. David cries out, O God, you are my God. I shall seek you earnestly. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh yearns for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Thus I have seen you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory because your loving kindness is better than life. My lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. My soul is satisfied with mar as with marrow and fatness and my mouth offers praises with joyful lips. How can David seek God earnestly and thirst and yearn for him in verse 1? It's because, verse 2, he has seen in the sanctuary, in the house of God, God's power and God's glory. Now, there was no temple at the time of David, actually, right? There was a tabernacle, and the Ark of the Covenant was there, and the true worship of Israel was taking place. And there, in Jerusalem, on Mount Zion, God, David saw, not with physical sight, the glory of God. He saw him. He knew him. And in seeing him in this way, what does he say in verse 3? He says, I've, I've basically tasted of your loyal covenant love for me, and it's better than anything in this world. It's better than life, and so my lips will praise you. And that's exactly how verse 5 ends as well. That love is so filling, that love is so rich and so deep, it's better than his own life, the most precious thing of all. So if I have to choose, David is saying, between my kingdom and my son's love and my palace and my even my people or your love, God, I would rather choose your love. All because what has he experienced by faith? Look at verse 5. His soul has been satisfied, is satisfied, as with marrow and fatness, the choicest pieces of meat. He's been satisfied with the loving kindness of God that deeply and richly and robustly. And so his mouth offers praises with joyful lips. And if you go on to verse six, he remembers God on his bed. He meditates on him in the night watches. He's, he's considering God as the one who's been his help, that in the shadow of his wings, he's been hidden and kept and protected. And so he sings for joy. He talks about how his soul clings to God and that God's right hand then is upholding him through all of these travails that he is experiencing because he's running away from Absalom. David, though he is in a dry and weary land, look at verse 1. He's in the wilderness, the desert of Judah. He describes the love of God and the satisfaction that he feels through believing in that love for him as a feast. He's in the desert, but he's talking like he's at a banquet. That's faith. That's the power of faith because faith locks onto the all-powerful, all-satisfying object, and that's God himself. Now, maybe... Especially this year, some of you are miserable and sad and anxious. And maybe it's not just because of this year. This year has only aggravated what's already been the case for some time. The challenge is this. How do I cultivate this type of superior worship, worship of Christ? How do I get these affections for Christ that will drive out the old affections so that I can have superior worship of Jesus Christ? I can adore and treasure Him. Because you can't just say... Well, Jesus is better. Mentally, we know that as believers. Jesus is better. But just saying that and just repeating that over and over again and trying to convince yourself, sort of arguing yourself into that or, or nudging yourself or shouting yourself into that is not going to work. We need to know that Jesus is better. We need to feel it. 
We need to experience this reality as an all-powerful, life-changing reality. Christ needs to be seen with more clarity, more truth. How? We need to engage our imagination with his real beauty in the gospel. Imagine that there are two fires that you're running. One is a fire of worship towards some idol. Anything that you have placed above God, you look to that thing for security, for love, for significance, for purpose and meaning in life. You have, you're, you're looking at that thing to give you what only God can give you. That's one fire. The other fire is a fire of worship towards Jesus Christ. Okay. Now, if I'm spending hours and hours and hours meditating on that thing, getting that thing, not having that thing, scheming for ways to get more of that thing, and I'm meditating on all these other things outside of Christ and even outside of my, my idol. Let's say I'm just meditating on social media, meditating on TV shows, meditating on what people think of me, meditating on how to make more money, meditating on all sorts of things in the world. Then the idols that I'm worshiping, the pleasures of my flesh that I want will weigh more and be more glorious than Christ and the fire of worship towards Jesus will be snuffed out in my heart. And of course, social media, TV shows, and what, what, the, world, uh, what the world values and expresses the, those values in media in all sorts of forms will, of course, not only starve out, those, uh, starve out my uh, love for Christ and my affections for Him, but it'll keep fueling. It'll keep blowing up what? It, the, those idolatrous desires. I'm going to look at the things in the world like money and career and success and approval and, and appearance and health and say, I have to have those things or else. And meditating on, focusing on, doing your devotions on, the things of this world will not help grow a superior worship of Jesus Christ. Now the issue is not the lack of worship. We are always worshiping beings because our hearts are always meant to worship. It's designed that way. It's not the lack of worship. It's not the lack of fuel. It's the huge amount of the wrong kind of fuel that then creates a blaze of idolatrous worship. We're always worshiping. It's just, what are we worshiping? And underneath that worship is fuel. And that fuel is either growing in one direction for that idol or another direction for Christ. And here's a little tip. It's easy to blow out a candle, but it's very, very difficult to put out a forest fire. Okay? And so we need to fuel a worship of Christ that you and I can carry with us, that we can refer back to, if you will, throughout the day, throughout the week, so that we are helped in turning away from our idols, not just from our external sins, but the deeper desires of the heart that express themselves outwardly in sin. we got to turn away from those things internally and turn to Christ and the gospel by faith. And so, how do we specifically then fuel that worship, the superior worship, the worship of Jesus Christ? How do we get these new affections? How do we grow these affections? And I would say this, as believers who have born-again hearts, you and I, we already have those affections in our new hearts. It's not like we have to go somewhere outside of Christ, outside of the gospel, and really outside of our regenerated hearts with the indwelling Holy Spirit to look for these affections and somehow bring them from the outside in. The Spirit lives inside of us. He is already always stoking that fire of love for Jesus Christ. So how can we specifically help in that process? How do we not stifle what the Spirit is already doing and wanting to do? How do we fuel more worship? Right? We need to fuel our faith in and love of God and starve our appetite for idols by deepening our knowledge of Christ. Deepening our knowledge of Christ. That's how. Colossians 3, 1 to 2 says this, If then you have been raised with Christ, and that's every believer, Paul says, seek the things that are above. How do you seek heavenly things? What do I do to, to um, accomplish this command? He says, that's the, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. And then he explains, look at verse 2 in Colossians 3. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. 
set your mind, fix your mind on there, focus your thoughts on Christ and who he is, the one who is seated at the right hand of the Father. All right, so letter A. There's really two ways we're going to talk about in, in terms of fueling worship. Letter A is this, build up your faith. You can build up your faith to fuel worship. And in fact, you have to, because it's false beliefs that fuel evil desires that then erupt into false or idolatrous worship. We got to work on the beliefs, the faith. That will help shape the desires, which will then help the worship on the outside on the inside and on the outside excuse me we got to build up our faith letter a building up our faith um how do we do this well faith is intimately tied to how we are thinking we just said saw that in colossians 3 1 and 2 faith is not vague faith is not abstract faith is my belief system remember it's my worldview it's how i see god it's how i see the world how i see my life okay it's a gospel-centered scripture-informed worldview that i need to keep um, building up Matthew 6 28 in Matthew 6 28 Jesus says consider the lilies of the field how they grow they neither toil nor spin consider consider the lilies of the field to, to guard against and to help against anxiety think about ponder reflect on the lilies of the field they don't work and yet they grow and they're beautiful the word consider here means to notice closely or examine carefully Jesus says this to us because what we ponder, what we meditate on, will either strengthen or weaken our faith. And so, how do we build up faith? We can build up faith in three directions. First is upward, second is inward, and third is outward. What do I mean? Upward. We can build up our faith upward by considering God. This is where everything begins and ends. We need to know better the God that we believe in and that we need to trust in and lean on the one whose understanding we should lean on rather than our own the one who we should acknowledge in all of our ways and not think that we have all this knowledge for those who think they know uh, they don't know yet right that's arrogance now think about this think about how a person like job for example he came to his spiritual senses when he was struggling with god in his massive sufferings so you can almost you can understand, humanly speaking, why he would struggle, okay? But what happens at the end of the book is that he's struggling with God. He's struggling with why these things are happening to him. And he has an encounter with God, or God encounters him with the reality of who he is and all of his might and power in chapters 38 through 40. And what happens is Job repents in dust and ashes, and he retracts what he has said in his complaint towards God. He humbles himself in submission to God, and he yields himself up to God in that point in time. You see, when we consider God, that's when things start to change. When we realize who he is, what he has done, what he is doing, and what he will do for us, things start to change. You see, when we're struggling, when we're sinning, we're backsliding, we're, we're, we're uh, worshiping idols in our hearts, God is going to seem very vague and distant to you, right? And it's going to feel like scripture isn't working. I, I, I'm trying to fight against the sin, but I'm, I'm just failing. God seems far away. God doesn't care. The Bible, I know it's true, but gosh, it doesn't feel true in my life. You know, imagine that there's a gal and she's stressed out with all these things going wrong in her life. And I ask her, you ask her, do you believe that God loves you? just cut right to the chase and she says yes but she also says this i don't i don't i don't know that god's love matters to me in my daily life i don't feel like he loves me and i don't really even feel that it matters now why does she feel this way why does she feel this way it's not because she's not a believer right? it's not because she she just hasn't done her quiet time Okay, it's not because she's not engaged in a, in a fellowship or service. Now, all of those things are important. Fellowship, going to service, serving people, quiet time, prayer. No one is saying that those things are bad. Those are essential. But what's going on? Why does she feel this way? She feels this way because her knowledge of God and his love for her isn't what? It's not being fueled. It's, not, it's staying cold functionally in her mind and in her heart. It is a 
malnourished understanding of God's love. So I need, you need to help that kind of a person, help yourself, right? Consider the depths and the heights and the breadth and the width of the love of God in Christ Jesus, Ephesians 3, 14 to 19. We often have trouble trusting God, not because we don't know enough about God, not because we have bad theology, but because we have such a functionally malnourished grasp of the doctrine of God and of his great love for us. That's the person we're supposed to trust in and acknowledge and lean on. We better know something about him that draws us to lean on him, acknowledge him, and trust him. Number two, we can also build up faith not only upward by considering God and his love for us, but inward, not trusting in ourselves. This is what I mean. By considering our new identity in Christ. The focus being on in Christ. In Ephesians 1 to 3, chapters 1 through, 1 through 3, Paul spends a lot of time. What does he do in those three chapters? He lays out the gospel and all of its glories, right? He's just thinking through what it means for us to be in Christ and for Christ to be in us, what took place in eternity past, what took place in a point in time, and what are the immediate spiritual implications of the gospel. If you just study Ephesians 2, 1 to 10, if you just walk through that and you see how Paul traces our story of redemption from being dead to sin to being what? In Ephesians 2.10, God's workmanship. Just, uh, <clears throat> God's workmanship in Christ created for good works, which he has prepared before the foundation of the world. We got to remember our in Christ identity, that we are in Christ and also that Christ is in us. We got to rem remember who we now are on this side of conversion this side of regeneration that though we were once slaves to various lusts and passions titus tells us what that there has been a washing of regeneration and renewal by the holy spirit by the holy spirit there's been a born again experience that has taken place through the power of the holy spirit as he uses the gospel and this holy spirit he has been poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that being justified by His grace, not by our works, our identity is we are justified by grace, so that being this kind of people, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. We're heirs, heirs with Christ, heirs of God. We're children of God. We're justified, declared righteous. We're washed clean. We're forgiven. We have eternal life. We know God and the Son whom He has sent. We're indwelt by the holy spirit we can go on and on about our new status new identity new position new hope new life in jesus christ that's so important so so important to know who we are to not think that we are our sins right? that that we are just defeated broken people who cannot change and that basically, like, the Spirit doesn't really operate in us. The gospel is actually not powerful to save us beyond just that conversion point, And that's it. That is so wrong. And it's actually so, debilit so debilitating to our faith and to our obedience and our enjoyment of God. Okay? Now, when we talk about remembering who we are in Christ, that can feel a bit passive. So as we talk about this issue of remembering who we are in Christ. It is not a remembering who we are in Christ so that we can just sit there and not change. Truly remembering who we are in Christ will always melt our hearts and then motivate us to what? To live for God's glory. Meditating on who we are in Christ will in fact change us. That's the point here. You cannot mind the purification that you've received of your sins from Christ without being moved to then live not for yourself but for him who died and rose again on your behalf that's always 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 going to happen okay and so just keep that in mind that in terms of being moved to obedience moved to worship moved to follow christ moved to seeking him passionately how that's connected to remembering who we are in christ is this as we remember by faith our hearts are changed renewed newly motivated or freshly motivated again to walk as jesus did to imitate him and to follow him now going back again to our identity 
when we forget the gospel and our new identity created by the gospel, created in Christ, and we say, my identity is now my success, my relationships, my occupation, my appearance, my ethnicity, my nationality, my possessions, my money and wealth. Right? When we make those things our identity, that's idolatry and it destroys us, it ruins us. We are detaching ourselves in our hearts from the identity that Christ or God has given us in Christ and reattaching our identity to these idols, to these things in the world. And we're saying that is what gives me meaning, purpose, and security and hope in this life. Now think about how someone who has a false identity would be so massively changed if they would, as a believer, understand their new identity in Christ. Think about it. If someone says, I'm a divorcee and I'm just a failure, that's her identity. That's his identity. And they're stuck there. Someone says, I had an abortion. I'm a murderer and I'm done for. Someone says, I constantly struggle with lust. I sin all the time with lust. I can never stop. That's all I am. That's all I can think about. That's the only sin I'm fighting. I have an eating disorder. That's who I am. And so what happens is you can turn that sin, which is real sin, that temptation and that sin complex, and you can make that your whole Christian life. That becomes the focus of your Christian life. Instead of remembering what? That though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor, yet I was shown mercy. I didn't grab mercy. I didn't earn mercy. You can't. I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord Jesus, of our Lord, excuse me, was more than abundant with the faith and love which are found in Christ Jesus. It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost of all. Yet for this reason, he says it again, I found mercy. What reason? So that in me, as the foremost, as the chief of sinners, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. And then he ends, now to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Why does he burst out in praise? Why does he burst out into that doxology? Because he found mercy, though he was so awful. You and I are awful in one sense now, but we were way worse before, dead in our sins. We were wholly defined by sin, right? We were sons of disobedience, children of wrath, children abiding under the wrath of God. That was our former family, our lineage, our destiny, however you want to put it. That's who we were pre-Christ, pre-regeneration. That's not who we are anymore. Paul doesn't get stuck in his past former life of evil towards Christ and Christians. He says, I found mercy. I was saved as a sinner by Christ. I believed in him for eternal life. Now he is my king and I want to honor and glorify him forever and ever and ever. And my life can and my life does some of us have forgotten who we are. Some of us have forgotten who we are. In idolatry, we're making that object of worship our new identity. Some of us are just mired or stuck in our sins and we can't get out. And that's all we're thinking about in our whole Christian life boils down to that sin or those past sins that haunt us. Some of us have forgotten who we are. We are purified by the blood of Christ. We are forgiven once and for all. We are loved by God. We are his children. And once we grasp all that we are in Christ, those are just a few things, all that we are in Christ, what happens to you and me? We naturally move towards God in repentance and faith. We do. We move towards him in worship. Not only do we build up our faith out upward, considering God, inward, considering our new identity in Christ, but outward circum towards circumstances and people. How do we think about them? How do we process them? How do we walk forward in bad circumstances with tough people around us? This is where we need a good practical theology of a lot of different topics. That's why the, the whole counsel of God, such an important idea to have all of scripture so that we can be informed in so many different areas of life. The Bible is so practical. In 2020, just as one example, we have learned that we need a robust theology, robust theology of suffering. What is suffering? 
Where does it come from? What does it mean? What's the end of suffering? Is there such a thing as arbitrary, meaningless, random suffering? People don't know how to process suffering. Even good and godly believers have a tough time processing what suffering means and what we are supposed to do and how, so, how we are supposed to think when we are in a suffering. We often don't know that God's grace has an agenda for change and for holiness, Christ-likeness, and for joy in Him. And that often works through suffering to accomplish that, right? We know that from, that's just replete in the Bible. Think about 1 Peter 1 and, and, and the, um, the faith that's purified through the crucible of sufferings. Think about James 1 where he talks about there's multicolored, various trials, big and small, that you're going to go through. And he says, consider it joy whenever you go through those things. Because of what kind of character fruit it's going to produce if you let perseverance have its work in you. You'll be complete in Christ. Think about Romans 5, 1 and following and the exhortations there based on our justification by faith. He says, not only this, but we also exult, we boast in our tribulations. Why? Knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance and perseverance, proven character and proven character, hope and hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. We need to have these scriptures in place to build into our faith a theology of suffering that is rich, gospel-centered, biblically informed through and through. For example, in Romans 8, 28, what does it mean that God causes all things to work together for good? Because we know that's the go-to verse for suffering. What does that actually mean? If you look at the next verse, you know what it means. And you look at other verses similar to it. It means God is making us like Christ through our sufferings. Christ is our definition of what is good. And to get us to that end of this ultimate good of Christ-likeness, God will sometimes compromise, or often, our temporary happiness to bring about our holiness and deeper joy in Himself and in His Son. That helps people in suffering. Why? Because, you, you, first of all, you don't minimize the suffering. You don't just say, ah, it's really not suffering. And secondly, you just don't, you don't, you don't, you give them hope. You don't say, well, that's a really tough suffering. I don't really know what the Bible has to say to that other than just sort of like, just trust and obey and, you know, uh, buckle in and you just got to grind it out, suck it up, or just hold on tight. These kind of like platitudes and cliches that we hate and yet often can fall back on or say to other people because we're not consciously thinking about minding and pondering and reflecting on the practical theology of suffering that the Bible gives to us. Other examples of practical theologies would be discerning God's will, which is right up there with suffering, or practical theology of suffering. God honoring communication. What, the, what does the Bible have to say about how I should talk to people, listen to people? Living in light of eternity rather than the now. And even something as very basic or as very practical, excuse me, as financial stewardship. How do I think about money? Why should I think about money that way? How should I think about giving, about generosity, about saving, about hoarding? What is my view, my heart's view towards wealth? And why it shouldn't be this way? <laughs> why it shouldn't be one way and it should be another? Right? These are just examples of practical theologies, okay? So, we can build up our faith upward by considering God inward by considering our new identity in Christ, and then outward by considering what the Bible has to say in terms of suffering, in terms of God's will, in terms of financial stewardship, and all these other areas, practical theologies. So that's building up our faith. That's how we fuel worship. It's through the Bible, through the gospel, uh, <clears throat> considering, reflecting on all of these areas of truth. And then letter B, not only do we build up our faith to fuel worship, we have to then re redirect our idolatrous desires from those idols to Jesus Christ. We have to see or be shown how the deeper desires behind our worship are actually found or fulfilled and satisfied in Jesus Christ. Because everybody has natural longings in our hearts, right? We want peace. We want joy. We want happiness. We want approval. We want rest. We want comfort. We want pleasure. And idolatry, idol worship, moves us to look for these things in the world, in people or things, rather than in who? Rather than in Jesus Christ. 
and some examples of deeper desires behind our idolatrous worship would be things like salvation. That's why people try to save themselves in false religions or in bad versions of the gospel or Christianity, where, it's, where it breeds a self-righteousness and a works, uh, uh, a works righteousness where you are literally trying to earn favor with God, to maintain your salvation and your own power and strength, to get to heaven through your good works. That's what every other religion is, uh, is based on. Salvation is one deeper desire behind idol idolatry. Another one is just life, wanting it, having it, physical life, which then is t attached to an, uh, an idolatrous obsession with health, for example, or love, intimacy, romance, relationships, friendships, uh, <clears throat> a, a marital partner, or security, security tied to money, or your career, or being with the right people in the right network. Uh, and the right job or identity that seems to cover everything doesn't it your identity as a mom identity as a, uh, a, a a worker your identity as a father your identity as um as, as as someone who has all the answers and people go to your identity as a minister right your identity as a servant uh in the church your you can take anything and make that your identity and it becomes this uh, source of idolatrous worship, even the best things in the world. You can turn serving at church, you can turn being a pastor, you can turn being a missionary, and it can become an idol because it's not actually fueled by an affection for Jesus Christ. It's actually fueled by an affection for yourself. Um, pleasure and comfort and hope are also other deeper desires behind idolatry. Um, one illustration to uh, to, to bring this home a little bit is from John 4 and the woman at the well. She's been married five times. She's now living with somebody else. And think about Jesus' response to her in John 4, 13 to 14. Notice that Jesus does not tell her, hey, stop getting married to these guys. Stop wanting men and their acceptance and their approval of you or anything else like that. No, what does he say? He gets to the heart of the matter. He says, I'm the living water. I'm the living water. There is sinful dysfunction going on in your heart. There's idolatrous worship going on in your heart. But what you really need is the ultimate answer. The answer isn't just stop doing this and start doing that. That The answer isn't just, you know, um, be better, right? The answer isn't just uh, men are not going to satisfy you, although that's true. He gives a positive Answer, that's the ultimate solution for every sin issue and problem in your life. John 14, 13, uh, John 4, 13 to 14, Jesus answered and said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. Talking about the well water, right? But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him, spiritual water, they shall never thirst. But the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. To eternal life. She wants to find her happiness and acceptance, stability, security, identity from others, from other men. But we want her, Jesus wants her, to find all of those things and then some in himself, in Christ. Now sin makes us want to find those things in the world rather than Jesus. And likewise, you and I may, find, may want to find, just in this one example, love from people. Right? Love from friends, love from boss, love from parents, love from a relationship. But the truth is it will not satisfy your soul. It will not last. And it will only wreck you if you put a burden on people or things that only God was meant to shoulder. Now here's a little caveat here. Think about joy, peace, security, comfort, and hope. All these things come through Christ. And these are internally realized in our lives through faith, faith in Christ, right? But Christians are not promised a life of ease. We talk about peace, joy, security, comfort, hope. We think, oh, carefree maybe. Maybe we think that way. Uh, a, a life of blessings, right? Tangible blessings. Things are going well. No problems. Sufferings are minimal at best. Christians, you and I are not promised those things at all. We are not promised a life of ease in following Christ. We can have joy, peace, security, comfort, and hope, actually, and pleasure in Christ 
but actually have a life riddled with sufferings. That's the glory of Christianity and the gospel. You and I may never get the things that we want, the thing that we think is maybe neutral or very good. We think it's a natural thing, like a desire for a spouse, right? The question to us is, would I be okay with not getting that? Am I? Not just would I, but am I content with not having that right now? And then the question after that is, how can I be content? How can I be more than okay with not having that? With God taking me down a different path in my life? And here's how, by being strengthened on the inside by faith in who? In Christ. Christ strengthening me by my faith in Him. How does that happen? Well, I have to sit at his feet, as Mary did in Luke 10. And I have to receive as I take up and read. And as I meditate on my night watches and ponder on my bed or wherever I am. And I have to receive who Jesus is, what Jesus teaches, and what he has done for me, is doing for me, and will do for me in the future. And that is a practice that should cover all of my days that I cannot afford to be lax with or push off to another time when things are less busy, when there's less suffering going on, when things have kind of died down and I'm sort of ready for that. No, that is what I need right now in the thick of it, in the trenches, in the fog of the war of life. I need to sit at his feet and mind by faith who he is and what he has done for me. The one thing necessary that cannot be taken away from me, is given to me in the moments where I am believing in Christ, where I am aiming my heart at Christ with, with humble submission and a desire to see Him and to know Him more and to be changed by Him. And the one thing necessary that cannot be taken away from me is Christ and His love for me. He will continue continuously give me that. He will continuously give me a greater experience of Himself. His all-satisfying, all-fulfilling, heart-redirecting love for me on the cross. That's why he says to the woman at the well, whoever drinks of this water, whoever drinks of Christ, you're going to have eternal life. You're never going to thirst. You're never going to spiritually thirst because all of your truest needs will have been met. And they can only be met by the one who made us, the one who made us for his own glory the one who loves us, the one who wants to dwell with us and us to dwell with him. Stephen Whitmer wrote, writes this, even after conversion, Jesus' followers all too frequently struggle to see God as glorious and desirable and to orient our lives fully toward him. We're tempted every day in a thousand different directions. Therefore, we must constantly reorient ourselves back toward God, seeing him anew, that's faith, and pursuing him afresh out of faith. And really, like, believing in him, longing for him, seeking him. Like, when David says Psalm 63, in Psalm 63, I seek you earnestly, he's not physically doing anything. He's just praying to God. <clears throat> he is just crying out to him. That is faith. That pursuit, that inner, earnest desire reaching out towards him is faith. That's faith. And from repentance, turning away from sin on the inside, then you turn towards Christ. Because you see sin as what it is, a grievous offense against God. It's ugly, it's horrible, it's distasteful, it's sickening. And you see on the other side, Christ is so much more sweeter, so beautiful, so lovely. I can taste his goodness, I can taste his love. I want him. God's supply to boost our faith and fuel our worship is more than our faith can take in. Because God has a river of delights for us in himself, Psalm 36, 4. And he has pleasures forevermore at his right hand, Psalm 16, 11. And he is a rewarder of those who seek him by faith, Hebrews eleven six. He has already rewarded you and me and believers out there with eternal life. What else could he give us? Oh, he can give us so much more. He can give us his Holy Spirit. He can give us a greater sense of nearness and intimacy with him he's going to give us the kingdom one day the list goes on and on and on we need to fuel our worship we need to fuel our worship and we do that by building up our faith and we do that by then redirecting our idolatrous desires from the things that we think can satisfy us to the only one who can and that's jesus christ let's pray father we thank you for the all-satisfying love that you have for us in your Son. 
Thank you that you care for us so deeply that you would give us your son so that we would have life instead of finding or trying to find our life here in this world. How miserable that is. How that leaves us completely ruined. But Lord, in Christ we have life and we have it abundantly. We have no thirst anymore. Our hunger, our, our, our thirst, the, these things are all satisfied and quenched in Jesus because of who he is and because of what he has accomplished for us, what he's done for us on the cross. We thank you that because of the cross, we are declared righteous in your sight. We are reconciled to you. We are forgiven. We are at peace. We are one with you and we are adopted into your family as sons and daughters of the living God. I just pray, Father, that for those of us who are struggling with idolatrous worship and the effects of that, of boredom, of joylessness, of loneliness, of misery, of sorrow, of pain and heartache, Father, that we would understand that ultimately the answer to life isn't to get rid of our problems, but ultimately it's to, it's to worship Jesus Christ. And we can only worship Him, the all-satisfying one, when we turn our eyes by faith and fix them on who He is, fix them on His glory, fix them on His beauty, and receive Him for all that He is, Lord. So please help us to fuel our worship of Christ by turning to Him, believing in Him, believing in all that He is and all that He has done for us, so that at the end of the day, Father, our hearts would be more than content if we are filled with Your joy. We thank You and love You. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.